special guest in the Informa studio, someone who's been the very forefront of uh, medical technology and the use of robotics almost from the very first day. His name is Professor Tony Costello. Welcome aboard. And more importantly, very much involved in the creation of AMRO, which is the Australian Medical Robotics Academy. Now, we'll talk all about that, but the exciting thing for me is let's go back and get a bit of an origin story. Um, you've been this medical uh, business, this way of life, for the better part of the last half century. Has much changed in that time? A hell of a lot's changed, George. The, uh, Australia has changed, huh? Australia's changed, medicine's changed. I grew up in a medical family. My dad was a GP. Uh, four of us of the seven did medicine at Melbourne University. Uh, my brother did law. He was a family failure and ended up a judge. <laughs> yeah, law. A black sheep. Um, and the others did uh, Melbourne University degrees as well. But uh, we had the uh, general practice in the house and uh, my father was very much into the value of education and uh, that was the way out of, uh, out of well, not poverty, but hard, mean streets, really. We grew up fairly, in fairly straightened circumstances. Now, we should reflect. Your father uh, was one of those unique individuals in that he completed the century. He we're did, not he got to 100. His, we're not talking about his cricket average, which may well be slightly lower than that because only Bradman was up in those, in those uh, centurion numbers. But your father lived for 100 years, got the letter from the Queen. He did. And was also... Uh, a baby from the Great War, yeah. uh, 1918. So he would have grown up through that uh, horrific time, or well, the 20s, of course. But he would have been at the at the beginning of his formative years, in at, uh, when the Great Depression had hit the yep. world and had travelled down under to Australia. D did he ever talk about those times? Talked about it quite a lot. His father was a policeman who was the son of a potato farmer from Ballarat, Irish, and. Uh, came to Melbourne, joined the police at 18 and ended up as chief superintendent of the police. He was a smart guy and had my father when he was really a bit older, it was the Irish way. And uh, so he grew up in a pretty tough environment through the 20s and 30s and started medical school at Melbourne University at 15. So he matriculated from St Kevin's at 15 and went to the University of Melbourne and did medicine before antibiotics, before any tuberculous therapy when life was really tough. So, but uh, you know, we, I helped him with the antenatal clinic when I was about six, you know, with all the pregnant women sitting in our front area of the house and I'd test the urine, you know, on the, on the cooker, at the back on the gas cooker. Wow. So I always thought, this is fascinating, you know, this is a great... Uh, so you got your entree very early on. Yeah. Just yeah. as I got a, my father wanted me to follow him into, in, into the automotive um, uh, engineering and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, motor industry and I refused. I, I, I had other aspirations. But it's interesting, you got your first, that little interest uh, for medicine very, very early on. Very early. It was very much imprinted. It used to take us up to the university on Sundays to get us out of the house from my mother, give my mother a break and show us where we went to med school. I thought this is a wonderful institution. You know, Melbourne University was a green belt. It was all lawns and trees and few buildings. When I the relationship between our educators and the students was very different then too, wasn't mm. it? All the professors were. Did you speak up at any stage? Did I speak did up? Did you ever speak up or did you sit back and uh, attend to it? He was, I was very attentive and, uh, you know, was a very more, um, uh, very didactic, uh, very pedagogic. And uh, so that was the way we learned. Uh, things have changed a lot now. Very much so. Technology. Um, before we go any further, I want to, we're, we're right in the middle of COVID, of course. Uh, the lockdown in Victoria has been most severe. Uh, the numbers seem to be changing and turning, and uh, the suggestions are that we will see some opening. But everyone's talking about li either living with COVID or waiting for a vaccine. When was the last successful vaccine launched in, in world medicine? Um, well, there wasn't one for HIV, for instance. Correct. And there wasn't one for SARS. I remember as a schoolboy when um, Sabin and Salk for China polio. Salk, yeah. We had uh, boys in my, two, a girl and a boy in my grade three class had oh, polio. Yeah. Mm. So that was revolutionary. So anti vaccines. And that's the 50s, isn't it? Yeah, that was in the mid 50s. Um, one was oral and one was an injection, and Salk and Sabin. And 
we've had so many different vaccines since. I mean, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, um, uh, then there was diphtheria before that. Um, but yeah. what are the chances of, we, of us finding a, a particular vaccine, a successful one, to combat the, uh, the threat of, or the, of the uh, COVID-19? Oh, I don't have any doubt there'll be a vaccine. I you think I thought it would be, be in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, whether it's f fully effective uh, over the whole co population cohort or not, but it'll be effective, how effective, and uh, there'll be vaccine, there'll be a number of different vaccines. Well, there's never idea. been as much concentrated effort on vaccine finding as there has been with the weaponry we have in modern medicine. So I, I've got great uh, um, optimism that that's going to be a solution or part of a solution. Mm. And I think the history of pandemics, they burn out anyway. You know, the uh, influenza and uh, after the no. first war, yes. it burned out. You get hurt Because immunity. we change our practices too. Well, we? we do. We change. Yeah, people started wearing masks in those days and washing their hands. Yeah. I mean. Surgeons only started washing their hands in 1850. 1850. So you were slow to the, to, <laughs> to coming to the uh, decision making as well. Oh. <laughs> Why are you so recalcitrant? Why are surgeons? surgeons? <laughs> well, they weren't doctors. They were apprentices. Oh. They started as barbers, uh, but apprentice to barbers and what have you. So the real doctors were the physicians, and that's why surgeons are called Mister in the UK because they weren't actually doctors. Oh. But it became... And we're um, still practising. They were. I mean, you know, draining an abscess was a very primary activity that surgeons did, and it was life-saving, you know, because there was no antibiotics. But um, surgery really started uh, in the Western world out of, I think, really out of the United States in the late 1800s in Johns Hopkins. There was a guy called Halstead who was a brilliant man. Famous, yes. Uh, who happened to be a morphine addict and a cocaine addict. And they did a television series called the Nick, which was loosely based on Halstead. Wow. But it was set in New York. And um, so uh, he, he uh, dis discovered or t taught the surgery by way of residency. The residency meant that if you want to be a surgeon, you lived in the hospital at Johns Hopkins for seven or eight years as his apprentice. And you were not allowed to have holidays. You were not allowed to be married. Yeah. There were no women, of course. 24 seven. 24 seven, seven days a week. And they did everything. And he developed the techniques of breast cancer surgery, gallbladder surgery, thyroid surgery, um, urology, uh, and uh, he started um, neurosurgery. So all the, he, these, these very bright boys, one was Cushing, and he started neurosurgery. Uh, urology was started at Johns Hopkins as a specialty. Um, and so it's really fairly recent yeah. that we've had one access to decent anaesthesia when that happened and then the surgeons washed their hands and then they decided to wear gloves and then they decided to gown up rather than use their the PPE. The PPE so cool. The PPE started yeah. then yeah, and wow. um, out of Johns Hopkins and then we have emulated that type of uh, training right up until now, a very sort of didactic, hard apprenticeship where you sit or stand by the surgeon and make a mistake and get yelled at and... and no initiative? Well, yeah, it varies. <laughs> the, the teacher, teacher the, the type of teaching you get has, it was, that I got was very variable, but mm. it was very strict and long Hierarchical? Enough, hierarchical. Yeah. Um, pretty good though. Yeah, but yeah, we had some good people going was, through. Yeah, so I think, well, I was very well trained. I trained in, here in Melbourne and then went to the US to Texas where I really got an eye opener right. about the American system and what they expected in terms yeah. of dedication. And then um, I went to the UK, which was fantastic as well, in the NHS. So I, I was uh, living with a, a senior scrub sister for the late Victor Chang. And I remember Victor invited me in to see the first cracking of the chest and. Uh, first heart transplant uh, that he was doing. I was at Channel 9 or was about to leave SBS to go to Channel 9. And we took a crew in. And I can remember them gowning up and everything. And then of course the screen went blank. As he made the incision and cracked the chest, the cameraman fainted. <laughs> so <laughs> It's pretty confronting when you see the chest. We heard a clunk and it was the, the cameraman fainting as the incision was made. So it was a very interesting time. But we talk about attitudes. I can remember as a young boy lining up, everyone at school lined up for the injection. How would we cope today? Well, there are so many people who you are may remember, reticent. 
that the nurse or the doctor heated the needle in between injections. And so if you were the last in a line of 30 kids and you got the 30th time it had been shoved through the skin, you got a pretty blunt needle and also, the, you know, infection control. So that was the way it was done. You know, I, and I don't, I, you know, we didn't know much better. Um, there were the, the bloodborne viruses like HIV, which would have been a Correct. problem. Okay. Or hepatitis. Hepatitis, or hepatitis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so when I started as an intern and resident at St Vincent's, uh, we uh, we didn't even we, we didn't didn't use PPE. So you put in an IV and someone you'd let them bleed all over you if, if it happened, or go to an arrest or somebody who was uh, stabbed or whatever. You'd be covered in blood, not mm. uncommonly. But there were even at that time in the uh, early uh, mid seventies. Um, That's the seventies. Yeah, men w would come in and die mysteriously. What we call the day plastic anemia. I think some of those were early HIV cases. Ah. Uh, and uh, it really only came out in the early 80s from San Francisco that what it was, virally induced um, hematology wow. problem. I've heard that uh, there were people as, as early as the 70s who were dying and of a mystery disease yeah. and not knowing that it was going yeah. to be labelled uh, in years to come as HIV. Yeah. So what a journey. What yeah. a journey for you. When did robotics start? When, when did you, why robotics, for goodness sake? Okay. Are, are we good enough to do it ourselves? Yeah, well, it's a master slave. So the master is still a surgeon. It's like a pilot in an aeroplane. But so the evolution was that up until 1988, nine, uh, we did everything pretty much open. Big, the bigger the incision, the braver the surgeon. Actually, it's the bigger the incision, the braver the patient. Wow. There are no brave surgeons, only brave patients. So there were, we loved doing big, big operations where you had your hands up to the elbows. But, um, and then the, this uh, concept of laparoscopic surgery, which actually had been around for a long time in Germany in the 20s and 30s, uh, just looking inside the belly, for instance, and then uh, someone said, "Well, if you're looking in, you might as well do something." So some instruments were developed, and mm. then, but it's a counterintuitive technology where you actually have to move your hand the, the other way to move the instrument the way you want it to go, and it was hard to suit you because you had no depth perception. So it was you tricky. had to learn all those things. We'll talk about that in part two of our interview. We're talking to Professor Tony Costello, who spent the better part of the last fifty years. Uh, not only as a surgeon, but thinking about ways to improve what he was doing. And uh, we'll tell you all about that in part two of this interview on The Informer.